Hello, everyone. Welcome back, everyone, to the series Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles, coming to you today from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and from Oxford University in Oxford, U.K., and from the United Nations in New York City. This is the first episode of the 2022 series, which explores the Multidimensional Poverty Index and other multidimensional metrics and how they can be used in policy. I'm James Foster, the Oliver Carr Professor and Vice Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University, representing the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP for short. I'm here with Sabina Alkair, Director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in the Department of International Development of Oxford University, and along with our colleagues at the Human Development Report Office of UNDP, we're pleased to offer today's presentation, Multidimensional Poverty in Children in Punjab, Pakistan, presented today by Rizwan el Hook, Research Fellow at OFI, with a discussion by Katie Rillen, Research Fellow and Co-Director of the Center for Social Protection at the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. In just a moment, I'll ask Sabina to describe the series and introduce the speakers. But first, I'd like to express my appreciation to Jacob Dirksen and the rest of the team at OFI for lining up the great series this term, and also to IAP Director Jay Shambaugh and Manager Kyle Renner and their team at IAEP for producing the series online. IAEP has many other events this week, including one immediately following this one entitled The Distribution of Wealth in Germany, 1895 to 2018. This is in their Facing Inequality series, and it's presented by Dr. Charlotte Bartels of DIW and currently at Harvard with commentary by Alice Enriquez Holtz of the Federal Reserve Board. On Wednesday, the Envisioning India series brings Kirit and Jyoti Parikh to IEP to present Equitable Action for Climate Change. And next week, please join us for our next MPI event when Sam Jones of WIDER will present Extending Multidimensional Poverty Identification from Additive Weights to Minimal Bundles. For those and other events, check out the website, iep.gwu.edu. And if you miss anything that you wanna see, catch the reruns on the YouTube channel IIEPGW. Now, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Sabina Alkair for her introductory remarks. Sabina. Thanks so much, James. And it's lovely to be with everybody here um, and those who are watching after the event. This term, we have a series of seminars in which we invite academics um, from different parts of the world and focused on different kinds of topics to think methodologically about ways to improve or deepen our understanding of multidimensional poverty metrics. So in today's seminar, Rizwan al haq will compare three different ways of looking at poverty in the Punjab in Pakistan and see whether or not at a district level, they come up with different answers for what dis districts to prioritize. Next week, Sam Jones will look at different weighting approaches. And then Kehinde Omotoso will look at gendered and multidimensional poverty in post-apartheid South Africa. And then Adriana Sanchieto Serra will look at multidimensional poverty in Brazil in the early 21st century using census data. And then we have Mauricio Gallardo, who will be measuring vulnerability in multidimensional poverty using a Bayesian network classifiers. So what we're doing this term in a nutshell is exploring the newer methodologies and how they either challenge or extend or confirm other approaches to multidimensional poverty measurement in the past. So today I'm very delighted to welcome Dr. Rizwan al Haq to present this paper. Rizwan is a, now a full-time research officer based in Oxford, and he works in both research and in applying the research to official statistics. But before joining 
Oxford, Ophi. He was a professor in the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, PIDE, and he worked for more than 20 years in population and development, looking at poverty, aging, and health. Um, when Pakistan developed its national MPI, he was working at that point with UNDP, um, and he also prepared a national human development report focused on young people. His doctorate is from Groningen in the Netherlands, where he also obtained an MSc, and prior to that, an MSc from Qadi Azam University in Islamabad. Our commentator is um, a very, very much an expert on this topic, and Dr. Katie Rowland, who is the research fellow and co-director at the Center for Social Protection in IDS Sussex. And she is a development economist, but has an interest in the dynamics of child poverty, as well as in linkages between social protection and child protection. And she has also worked in many international organizations, including UNICEF, Sao Concern Worldwide, and particularly in Asia and Africa. Um, she has qualitative as well as quantitative insights and skills. And she uh, completed her PhD um, in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And she also had an MSc from that same university. So we have a wonderful combination of people and Katie, I must say her doctorate looked at false positives or hidden dimensions. So both she as well as the, the main paper are trying to really ferret out a better way of understanding the complexity of child poverty, but also understanding the reality of limited data sets for frequent updating. So over to you, Rizwan. Uh, thanks, Sabina, and uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity again to present paper here. Uh, I'll share my screen. Yeah, so the title of the paper is Multidimensional uh, Poverty and Children in Punjab, Pakistan. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, UNICEF because this was a project by UNICEF and they, uh, they funded the project and eventually uh, we wrote a report for them. And then this paper is uh, uh, part of that report in a way. And also thank uh, other colleagues uh, from OFI who uh, helped us in uh, writing this, this paper, uh, Hector uh, Moni and other colleagues as well. So child poverty. So it's, uh, well recognized postulate that children experience poverty differently from adults. And when we are trying to devise different measures to capture the deprivation or poverty of the children. So these measures must consider the many and distinct ways in which children's lives can be deprived during their childhood and adolescence. So what we have then, so how to measure child poverty then? So we have certain measures there available. For example, the options are uh, national MPI with children uh, related questions. So we have different questions which are child related. So that is an option, but that is a household level uh, measure. The other one is a child desegregated national MPI. This is an offshoot of the national MPIs. And simply we see that how many children, what is the percentage of children which are experiencing poverty. In a way, they are residing in those households which are categorized as poor, uh, according to MPI. The third one is gendered and intra-household analysis of child indicators. So here again, it is again the offshoot of the national MPIs that we go much deeper into the household and see which of the household members are experiencing certain levels of deprivation. And there we can study the child deprivations in a much deeper way. And the fourth one is individual child MPI, which can be linked to the national MPI. So additional indicators, additional dimensions can be included in that. And we can see that the individual child poverty, individual child related indicators are included. And we can study the deprivations of children which they experience individually rather than at household level. So it's a much deeper way of studying MPI. So we have these four options. And uh, the objective of the paper is 
how empirical analysis varies between the three options. We are actually taking out the option of intra-household analysis uh, of uh, child-related indicators because other papers are available on that. But in this paper, we will focus mainly on the national MPI, the child disaggregated national MPI, and individual child MPIs, which are linked to national MPIs. So what is the scope of study? We would, would like to undertake this. So 2017-18, multiple indicators cluster survey mix for Punjab, actually, uh, we tried to mimic the national MPI of Pakistan. Just to give you a background of mix in Pakistan, that uh, it is not being done all across the country at one point of time. So different uh, planning departments undertake that at different point of time. So we don't have any consolidated data available for Pakistan for this survey. And it is quite a rich survey. In a way, we have child-related questions into that. And apart from that, it is also at the district level for Pakistan. So we have DHS, but DHS is at the provincial level in Pakistan. But this survey is at the district level, and it has child-related uh, questions into it. So this survey is being used for Punjab which is the largest, uh, in terms of population, is the largest province of Pakistan. And then it is uh, the proxy MPI, we may call it, because it is not the actual national MPI. We would like to mimic that. So the MPI proxy will be disaggregated and comparatively analyzed by the age groups to show variation within Punjab. And then, as I said earlier, that an individual child MPI that is directly linked to national MPI proxy is also introduced. So here, uh, one question that comparisons here are based on the proxy MPI, not the actual national MPI. So giving you a background of the national MPI, that Pakistan launched its first uh, MPI report in 2016 based on six waves of uh, PSLM data. So the latest of them were 2014-15 PSLM data. And now we have another uh, way, way of the data. We have, that data has been analyzed, but the results are not yet public. So the comparisons are not made with that national MPI. So the research questions are, uh, do the three measures, I mean the proxy MPI, the child disaggregated MPI, and the linked child MPI converge using mixed Punjab and these MPI definitions? And the second one, how well does the proxy MPI depict the district level poverty which emerged from the nutritional data available at the district level? As I said earlier, that uh, in the household level, national MP, uh, data which we use for the national MPI, there were some child related questions, but a very important question on the nutritional data that was missing uh, in the PSLM data. And we are using that's why mix, which does provide that data. So here are the comparison of uh, two uh, measures and the mix from mix proxy MPI and the national MPI. So for education, uh, and uh, we have out of three, two indicators were there in mix. Uh, school quality was a bit of very crude variable, but the most important variable which was missing uh, in mix was access to health facility but we have all others variables were there. And uh, the weights were, they were reweighted, the indicators were reweighted accordingly, so that we have uh, at the dimension level, we have one third of the uh, cutoff value uh, intact. For living standard, we have all the variables there, but land and livestock has, uh, a bit of the information was missing and the area of the land was missing. So here, uh, these are the, all the variables from the comparison between these two. So years of schooling and child education for education were there in proxy MPI and immunization, antenatal care and assisted delivery for health were there and for living standard, all variables with a slight change in the land and livestock. So methodology of the linked child MPI, what is it? It's the draw approach to child MPI measurement. So augments the national MPI with one child specific dimension having two indicators in this case. So we have actually uh, 
two indicate one dimension is introduced and it has two uh, indicators. The indicated definitions vary by age of the child from zero to 17. So children are identified as below 18. So for different age specific characteristics, there are certain indicators uh, are defined in a way which are age related. Retain the national MPI identification function. So all children poor by national MPI are still poor. So the weights are redesigned because I'll come to that later, but uh, we had for each dimension, we had 33% of cutoff value uh, of weight with a cutoff value of 33% for uh, a household to be identified as poor. But here we have, when we introduce the, in the draw approach, the fourth dimension. So the cutoff value for uh, poverty is 25%. Mayor's poverty at the individual level can identify poor children within non-poor households. So a child is actually, it is at child level, not at the household level, and identifies the incidence, intensity, and composition of individual child poverty. So these are the first part, the first one, the national MPI proxy, these are the results for, from the mix for Punjab. So uh, in Punjab, we can see that uh, urban areas are, uh, there are 36% of the population living in urban areas, where in rural areas it's around 64%. But the poverty is much more prevalent in the rural areas, which is around 35%. And in urban areas, it's 10% whereas the oral poverty in Punjab is 26% with an instancy of 48%. So the poor are actually, uh, they are deprived in 50% of the indicators. Divisions are actually categorized as areas which are the combination of different districts. So there are nine divisions in Punjab and uh, the southern part of the province uh, is much more deprived. These two districts, uh, divisions which are highlighted, Jihan Bahulpur, they are the southern divisions. And uh, Rahul Pindi, sorry for that, that they are uh, not highlighted in a way. Uh, and the Gujanwala, that is 12.4. So there is disparity between north, south, and urban rural. So further, we have censored and uncensored headcount ratios. So, so uncensored headcount ratios are people who are deprived in a particular indicator irrespective of their poverty status. So these are uh, with lighter shades and the censored headcount ratios are with the brighter shades. So censored headcount ratios are, are those who are poor and deprived in a particular indicator. So we can see that electricity, antenatal care, uh, these are in, in these of the variables, we can see that all those who are poor, uh, they're also deprived in that variable as well. So not much difference, but we can see some differences as well. And uh, cooking fuel for the uncensored ratios, most of the people are deprived in cooking fuel. And after that is overcrowding. So these are the contributions of different indicators and the contributions and uh, they take into account the weight of the uh, of a particular indicator. So as we know that some of the indicators have higher weight. So that's why we can see their contribution is much more than what we can see here in the uncensored or censored headcount ratios. So the reason is they are, uh, their weight is also taken into account. And that's why we can see the years of schooling, uh, school attendance and immunization uh, they have a higher um, share in the, uh, they contribute higher in the MPI uh, as compared to other variables, other indicators. So in the nutshell, the proxy MPI reveals that uh, in Punjab, 26% of the people are poor, 47.6% is the intensity. And uh, for the districts, we, as I said, that North is better off than South and urban areas are better off than uh, rural areas in terms of uh, headcount ratios. Now I come to the second one, the age segregated uh, MPI from the proxy MPI from the mix. So here uh, we can see that the incidence uh, 
national uh, provincial incidence was 26%, but for children is 32%, whereas the, for adults is 21%. So we can see that much more people are now, uh, with this second measure, more children are categorized as poor, uh, which were previously, uh, which was not the case. So we are having a much deeper picture in a way. So things are coming up that much more uh, children are uh, categorized as poor, which were previously not. And these are the, these are the comparisons uh, of the sensor dead count ratios by age. And uh, as we can see that uh, for all the indicators, children's sensor dead count ratios are much higher than other two groups. And uh, they are significantly different uh, apart from water and um, electricity. Otherwise, for all other indicators, they are significantly uh, higher than. So coming to the third one, so we have different priority dimensions indicators, and uh, we have taken care of these. For example, school attendance, early child education and development, nutrition, we don't have a national uh, MPI, child mortality, immunization, anti and prenatal care, child labor and child protection. These are most of the variables are taken, for example, child labor, the definition is there for ILO, but we have taken the definition, which is from UNICEF. So these are the, this is the dimension which we included for child MPI, in addition to the indicators which we have for national MPI. So here we have two indicators. First one is child nutrition and labor. And it is very child specific. Looking at the needs of the children at a specific age, those related to nutrition and labor. So for nutritional status, it is for below five years of age. And for child labor, it is five to 17. So for nutrition status, a child below five years of age is underweight or stunted, so that child would be deprived. And for child labor, we have actually, again, categorized according to the age, based on the UNICEF definition that for five to 11 years of children, a child who during the reference period did at least one hour of economic activity and or more than 21 hours of unpaid household services. For 12 to 14 years of age, uh, during the reference period, he or she did at least 14 hours of economic activity and or more than 21 years, hours of unpaid household service. And the third one is for 15 to 17, uh, that during the reference period, if he or she did at least 43 hours of economic activity. So these are the cutoff points. These are, and uh, to categorize them as deprived. The other one is cognitive development. It has much more uh, categories. So first one is for those who are less than six months of age. So we have excluded exclusive breastfeeding. If not, then that child is deprived. For six to 23 months is birth registration, safety and stimulation for two years old children, preschool safety and stimulation for three to five, three to four, and for five to 14 years of age, it's school and preschool attendance. So if a child is uh, not attending school, then that child is deprived. And the finally for 15 to 17 years of age, cognitive development, indicator has this particular uh, indicator need as plus marriage, child school attendance, that if a child in this particular age bracket is not in education or employment or is married with or with the child, then that is uh, regarded as deprived. Now here we can see that both indicators have one over eight weight, 12.5%. So the total weight of this dimension is 25%. And for all the three other uh, dimensions uh, which we had for national MPI, they are again reweighted to 25 percentage. So now we have 100 percent, and the cutoff for poor uh, to be regarded as poor is now reweighted to 25 percent. So these are the results. Now the third one. So by national M uh, proxy MPI, we had 26 percent of the children were poor. For disaggregated uh, age disaggregated analysis, they were. 32%, and now here, 50% of the children are poor. So we can see that much more, uh, the deprivation of the children, the poverty status of the children are 
really coming up. Most more of the children are deprived, and it is being. We can see that the visibility is much clear with this with the third one. And as we can see, that their intensity is forty three point five percent, with an overall M naught as zero point two two percent. So censored headcount ratios. So these are again, uh, the results are quite, I mean, clear that years of schooling is there, but school attendance not. So years of schooling is the highest among the lot, the 38% uh, after cooking fuel, which is 38.2%. And then we have overcrowding and <clears throat> cognitive development. So what about gender? Is there any difference? So we can see that there's no significant difference between girls and boys in terms of M0 and H. If we consider the child MPI, now we are talking about the child MPI, but girls have a small but significant increase in intensity. So the intensity of the girls increased, but that is significant. And more than half of the boys and girls are poor. This is the main thing that 50% of the boys and girls both are poor. So this is a redundancy test. It is actually percentage of potential matches which are associated in a way that the coefficient R is obtained by dividing the proportion of people with simultaneous deprivation in any two indicators by the minimum of the two indicators uncensored head count ratios. So this coefficient R takes value 0% when no one is identified as deprived in both indicators being considered and 100% when every individual who is deprived in the indicator with the lowest in incidence of deprivation is also deprived in the other in indicator. So here, the main thing which is of our interest is the newly introduced two uh, indicators. And we see that the lower redundancy is there. We can see that 7, 0.73%, 73% of those deprived in cognitive development are also deprived in school attendance, but 26%, 8.8% are not. So it was, in anticipation that perhaps years of schooling was there and in the cognitive development, there were some things related to school, uh, child schooling, but we see that it's only 33%. Now this is uh, an interesting result. These are all the districts and we have uh, M0 uh, for proxy MPI, child desegregated MPI and child MPI with the confidence intervals. And we can see that most of them have an overlap with a very few, for example, for CL code, I don't have pointer otherwise I would have, for a couple of districts, there isn't any uh, overlap. Otherwise there is an overlap at least for two of the measures. So we can see that there are, I mean, yes, the child uh, M0 is, child MPI is much higher than other one, but we can see that there are actually uh, overlaps are there. And these are the districts, uh, district rankings. So we can see that those with the least uh, poor districts uh, among the top eight, these are perhaps, uh, all eight are similar, but there might be a bit of difference in their ranking. And same is the case for with the highest poverty, uh, uh, those who are do the higher number of poor children. So we can see that the bot, the top 12 districts, same districts are there in with a couple of uh, incidences where we might have a different ranking. Otherwise, the districts are the same. And these are the correlation and signed rank tests. So we can see that mostly, I mean, more than 99% uh, of the times M MPI proxy and the child MPI have uh, the same rank test, the association is 9.99. Similarly, we see that it's a lot, more than 90% for most of the cases. And the Wilcoxon sign test is also uh, fails to reject the H0, that there's a difference. So we can see that for more than 90% of the times, 
the ranking between, if you compare between M0, H, and A, between child MPI with proxy MPI or with uh, disaggregated child MPI. So the ranking remains the same. This is also for the nutrition that the co uh, we correlated the percentage of households with undernourished children and the proxy MPI, child disaggregated MPI and child MPI at district level. Here again, we can see that the correlations are much higher. So what is the conclusion that despite, we, we see that there are, if we look at the numbers, they are uh, significantly different, but the rankings are not. So this is, uh, we can see that there is an added value to it. We can see there are certain patterns. And uh, we may say that when data are scarce, the national MPI proxy and its child disaggregation can be used to identify priority districts. So they really identify which are the priority districts if we want to really have interventions to alleviate the poverty. Thanks, James. Thank you so much, Ruzwan. That, that was very good. So we will turn it over now to Katie um, for comments, discussions, questions, um, and to start the engagement. Thank you so much, Sabina, and thank you for the presentation. My internet uh, connection is a bit unstable, so I apologize in advance if I freeze. I hope if that happens, I don't have too awkward a face, um, but I will come back to you. Um, but let me first thank you for asking me to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, as you've just heard, it's a very systematic exploration of multidimensional poverty and multidimensional child poverty in Punjab. Um, and I really appreciated how the paper set out the methodologies and looked at how the three different measures provide a picture of multidimensional poverty and multidimensional child poverty, particularly for the different districts and showed such consistency. I think it adds to um, the evidence base on multidimensional poverty and the measures that we use to uh, get this empirical insight in a very important way. Now, I have been reading this paper mostly with um, a lens of looking at how multidimensional measures used at the household level can be adapted uh, to look at child poverty um, from the household perspective or at a more individual level. And I think here the paper has a lot to offer in contributing to the very important and lively debate of how to measure child poverty from a multidimensional perspective using household level measures or more individually based measures. And I would like to make three points after reading the paper. Um, the first one is that this paper very clearly shows that there is benefit in focusing in on children if we want to find out more about how children are affected by multidimensional poverty and look at what specific areas are of importance if we want to tackle child poverty. Um, so because it's done so systematically, the paper points out really clearly that if we move from the more household level proxy MPI towards a child disaggregated MPI towards the child level MPI, the headcount rates and the other measures increase. So the more we focus in on children, the more we see that children are disproportionately affected by poverty. Now for people working on child poverty, this will be stating the obvious, but unfortunately we cannot overstate the obvious enough. We still need more data information and particularly information at this level, province level and then district level to evidence and highlight to policymakers that children are a particular relevant group to focus on, not just because children are such an important um, group in the population to direct policy actions at, but also because they are more affected by poverty. Um, and also in the presentation, it was pointed out that this cuts across all indicators in the multidimensional poverty measure. It's not just a headline figure. And I think that's really powerful. Then I would like to point out two challenges that I think also emerge from this paper. And these are not necessarily specific to the analysis in this paper or even the methods used in this paper, they speak to the wider concerns around how you adapt multidimensional measures to look at child poverty. And the first challenge is around data constraints, um, which I think Sabine already mentioned during the introduction. I think this paper really clearly 
uh, points at how far you need to stretch the data to bring in child level indicators. So the child MP MPI includes this new fourth dimension with two indicators specific to, uh, to children, but they're quite um, diverse indicators, if you will. So for example, we saw that nutrition and, and labor indicator with these two sub indicators, one related to nutrition for children aged zero to five or four inclusive and child labor five to 17. And you could argue they show really different things. Um, and I totally understand the need to combine these two sub indicators into one indicator to have one indicator that cuts across age brackets, but they do point to quite different elements in children's lives. Um, so it comes back to quite a fundamental debate within multidimensional poverty measurement, what combination of indicators makes sense. And here, I think it's a particular question uh, and that relates more generally to child poverty measures, how do you combine sub indicators so that you have one indicator that cuts across age brackets? And this is a specific issue for child poverty measurement because so many of those indicators all um, refer to uh, particular age brackets within childhood. So we, we have these indicators for zero to five or for higher up, um, but you also have the same issue with the second indicator included in that domain. So choices like this are inevitable, and everybody who uh, wants to measure multidimensional child poverty has to grapple with them. Um, but we have to think about how far we can meaningfully stretch that data. And I'd certainly be interested uh, in hearing the author's uh, response, but also your considerations in, in how you did this, how you decided to go this direction, because I'm sure you've had many conversations about it. The second challenge I wanted to highlight is um, also inherent to multidimensional measurement, poverty measurement or poverty measurement in general, but maybe specific concern for child poverty measurement. And that's the binary nature of poverty measures in this case. Either we, we decide something is good or something is bad. Someone is deprived or not deprived. Someone is in poverty or not in poverty. Um, and I think this is, this of course is, always a problematic issue and something um, you know that we have to deal with when we develop these kinds of measures but I think it's particularly problematic for children because of who gets to decide what is good or bad and let me make this a bit more tangible when I come back to the child labor indicator for example I'm aware this is based on ILO or UNICEF definitions but there's also now a wide literature on definitions of child labor not necessarily reflecting the reality of children's work and what work means in children's lives. And the fact that if we look at a number of hours worked per day or per week, it's not as easy to say when it goes over this number of hours, it's a bad thing or otherwise it's a good thing. And so lots of um, ethnographic research that um, you know, shows that the binary nature is really quite problematic. And I think for those of us working on child poverty measurement, it is really time to engage with that a bit more critically because um, we need to hold on to something in order to make decisions about thresholds and cutoffs. But with that, I think oftentimes we overlook some of the critical um, evidence from more qualitative, qualitative ethnographic studies about um, you know, the, the sticky issues there that aren't really capturable in, in binary measures. So to sum up, um, I really applaud this paper. I think it adds to the um, empirical evidence base in a very important way, not just in Punjab, but in general. Um, really powerful comparison of these three different types of measures and uh, an additional uh, complement to what we know about child poverty. I would also say then, in relation to those two challenges, to move the needle on multidimensional child poverty measurement, I think we need to start moving towards two things. One is a real push for more um, nationally representative child focused survey data so that we don't have to stretch the household survey data that we have to such an extent that arguably it becomes really difficult to draw conclusions for children from this data. 
And secondly, to have much more of this critical engagement with um, children's own voices and experiences in relation to indicators, indicators that we include, especially to capture children's experiences within the the households within the communities they live. And so that means engaging much more with the work that's been done in childhood studies, for example, uh, whether that's by academic scholars or civil society. Not easy, but uh, also a quite an exciting piece of work to move this, this uh, agenda forward. So thank you again, and I look forward to conversation and discussion. Thank you so much, Katie. Those were very, very clear and constructive inputs. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for them. I'd like to give the floor back to Rizwan to respond. And meanwhile, we will open the Q&A box um, for any questions. Um, and do please um, prepare questions. And, uh, but in the meantime, Rizwan, would you like to respond? Yeah, thanks, Kitty, for, uh, for reading the paper and commenting and for, uh, for the compliments as well. So uh, Subina, I would uh, reply the second question and leave it the first one for you. So the binary nature of the indicators. So uh, regarding the binary nature uh, of the indicators, there are, I mean, uh, different other definition like for those who are destitute. So we move from the binary nature to other uh, levels as well. Uh, whereas for the, uh, for the MPI is concerned that we say that people are deprived in some of the indicators and they are not. And how can we uh, really have a line on there or cut off that if it, like for example, the example given there that there are certain other definitions that we are saying that uh, at least one hour of economic activity, what about if a child is working less than one hour and that would be non-deprived. I think for the simplification of the, if we want to measure certain things, we really have to, look into things in black and white to make some things out of it. And uh, this is just uh, to identify the people who are in a particular, uh, living in a deprived life for a certain uh, variable. So I think my personal view is that yes, definitely we should, this is the, the, just the starting point and uh, things would be much more uh, detailed and studies must be done, which would be eth ethnographic studies and the qualitative studies. But this is the starting point that these are the areas which are real problematic. And these, this is the situation for regarding a particular variable, even if we consider the binary nature of the indicators. So Bina, would you like to add? Yes, no, thank you so much. So I'll switch hats because um, we've worked on this together a little bit. Um, and I think that one issue that Katie raised very rightly is age brackets and sub indicators within an indicator. And perhaps what we need to do is make public an exercise that we do, which is that for each eligible population, we also obtain the censored and the uncensored headcount ratios of that indicator. Ideally, we would combine indicators that are accurate for that subpopulation and that also have more or less similar headcount ratios in the sense that Otherwise, certain age groups will be uh, discriminated against simply by the particular indicator that's included. Um, so I think that that's something that can be shared because it's empirical and it exists. But I think that the further question is that in undertaking these individual children indicators, we called for input because we are not experts in children. Um, we asked for input about the age-specific deprivations that children have, how to use the mixed surveys, which are designed to look at children, um, and make the best use of that. Um, but it's been difficult to get, and so I think it would be really an interesting conversation to convene, because measuring people can do what they measure, but they may not have the insights on which are the indicators. So whether it's children's experts, childhood um, studies, um, CEOs, C CSOs, or others. I think it's it's a very important to I thing to engage. And otherwise, as Rizwan said, it's certainly possible to have uh, different poverty cutoffs, indeed different deprivation cutoffs. But I think the further question that you brought up is in the case of child labor, if there's egregious 
dangerous or um, difficult labor that's only a few hours a week, an hour cutoff is not going to capture it. And so how can we change the surveys? The question that I would have is that if we go for individual child surveys, then we may lose the link to national MPIs. And that actually may be quite a costly loss. And so there might also be a discussion about whether a very lean, mean, powerful set of child specific questions can instead be brought into the center of other household surveys, displacing questions that perhaps are asked but not analyzed so effectively for policy. Because in that sense, then you're mainstreaming rather than creating a marginal um, set of questionnaires that would be disjoint from um, the national poverty measures and perhaps some of the policies they inform. So those are two ways, and it takes a better person than us thinking about, again, theories of change in politics to know which will in the end be better for children's lives. But I think thinking about that and the possibility of mainstreaming children's questions should be something. So I've wandered on a while, hoping that somebody will put questions in the Q&A box um, and so far being unsuccessful. So I wonder if um, any panelists would like to raise their hand or Katie, if you'd like to come back while the uh, others participating in this call gather their thoughts and jot down some reflections, critical comments, inputs, references into the Q&A box. Thank you, Rizwan and, and Sabina for your responses. Let me just quickly respond to your point, Sabina, about um, it may be wiser to have um, a lean, maybe additional module in existing household surveys. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I do agree. Become, it might become quite marginal. Um, so that would certainly be a good way forward. Can you just that last little bit, you, you hung with a beautiful expression just momentarily. <laughs> I was agreeing with your with your suggestion to include a module potentially in existing household survey data, as whether that's mix or DHS or, or other ones, so that it becomes integrated. It allows for for the links to a national MPI or other uh, measurements that's currently based on such surveys, rather than trying to initiate another set of surveys, which uh, is a, a tough feat. Thank you so much. Um... Are there any other comments or, or inputs? While people are, are gathering their thoughts, um, I have a question for Rizwan, uh, to which I don't know the answer, which is uh, to what extent in your view, as somebody who sort of has looked at the data for Punjab uh, at different times, will any of the, the findings be surprising? I.e., is there perhaps a perception among those who look at child poverty in Pakistan, that the child conditions would be different in the South than the North? Or do you think that the empirical findings here, in a sense, are corroborated by other studies of childhood uh, from other data sets or more generally? Yeah, thanks, Vina. Uh, I mean, it's a pity in Pakistan that uh, Time and again, surveys are having the same findings. I mean, if you look at uh, area, if, by area or in terms of uh, deprivations, which indicators are deprived of for most of the population. So by time and again, they are the same, same results are coming up from, uh, I have been looking at PSLM from 20 to, uh, 2004 till date, I have seen DHS mix and uh, the results are almost the same. All those areas which were identified in 2004, they were uh, at the bottom uh, in terms of uh, poverty. I mean, uh, in terms of number of people who are, maximum number of people are still there. So it's a pity. And um, I, I think that most of the results for, to me, they were, I mean, well, in anticipation, what I, I have thought about. Um, just a couple of things, uh, for example, that uh, for individual child mayor, they are significantly different, but the rankings are not. So this is also in line with the anticipation, whoever has some knowledge of Pakistani data. Thank you so much. James? 
I just had a general question that maybe Rizwan can can uh, help me thinking through. I've been thinking through questions of inequality. And as you look at the data and you see different regions or you see different groups of people, uh, what stands out from your own results that might be able to tell us something or inform us about inequality? In this case, perhaps among kids, but also it could be just inequality more broadly in uh, Pakistan. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, in terms of inequality, I mean, uh, there are different angles uh, by which we can look into the inequality. So one would be to look into that uh, for the poor, poor children itself, that how much inequality is there, which they are experiencing. So I think that there are some nice research questions lying there. Uh, based on these findings, which we have that we have rich data sets in Pakistan. And uh, uh, for inequality, I mean, I think that, uh, yes, I can't say anything about it right now, but there are certain, some new dimensions, new ways which can be discovered, new uh, highlights might, might be very interesting to look into that uh, how the inequality among the poor children, among the poor people, they are, I mean, driving different things and how can we study them? So as I said that we have very rich data and uh, so different things can be done. But at the moment, I think that uh, I can't say anything apart from this, that there are certain research questions which we can really look into. Thank you so much, Rizwan. Katie. Thank you, Rizwan. I was also intrigued in the paper that much of the, the focus, um, maybe the rationale for the paper and also the conclusion was centered around comparing the three measures um, and whether it points to consistent rankings at a geographical level. Um, of course, in the paper, you highlight child poverty is higher and it becomes higher when you have a greater child focus in your indicator. But it seemed like the focus on the rankings and evidencing that the rankings re remain consistent across these three measures was more of an issue than highlighting um, the prominence of child poverty. I was wondering now with, with the findings that you have, do you think that this will also help to highlight the plight of children and maybe in Punjab and Pakistan more generally to get government actors to focus more on child poverty and maybe measure child poverty, multidimensional child poverty on a, on a more consistent basis? I mean, uh, thanks Katie uh, for this question that uh, why we are focusing more on the, on the ranking. So um, as we have seen that for the Pakistani national MPI, which is the household level, we still have certain indicators which are related to children. We have child schooling and uh, we have other, uh, for, example, for example, immunization is there. But apart from that, there are certain indicators which are missing. So mix gives, gives us an opportunity to look into those very, for example, malnourishment was missing very important, very important indicator, which, which is missing in the PSLM. So mix provide us an opportunity to look into that. Now, the purpose of comparing all three measures was that yes, yes, we may have uh, different magnitude of different indicators. For example, age, we see that from 26% to 50, uh, more than 50% it jumped for the child alone indicator uh, measure. But we don't, we have scarcity of data. So how would we look into that if we don't have data? Because as I said, for mix, it is uh, being done by the provincial departments at different points of time. And for sometimes we don't have data for some of the provinces, but we have for others. So how the proxy MPI, the national MPI proxy can be worked out to identify the, um, uh, those areas which are problematic. So in a way, so these are two things. One is the magnitude and the one is ranking. So looking at these in terms of substituting the other measure, that was the main point of this whole paper, that if we have scarcity of data, so in that particular situation, how would we move around from in Pakistan? If we look at in a Pakistani context, we have PSLM, 
that is district level and it has some child related indicators but mix as i said earlier that it has much more richer data but it is not uh, consolidated for the whole country so in in this when we have to um, uh, a trade off between the data availability and uh, on on the other hand uh, the frequency of the data so that might be uh, i think one major finding of this paper that uh, they point out to the same areas which are problematic even though we have scarce data Thank you so much, Rizwan. And I might just quickly add to that, that um, Pakistan does look at SDG localization and look at budget allocation in some provinces that considers the level of MPI. And so there's also the policy question. If SDG localization is happening, but the national survey that's driving it lacks nutrition, lacks child labor, how much would these results change? And we didn't actually expect the convergence that uh, Rizwan presented. Um, it's a little bit of a surprise that they are the same. We need to check in other data sets and with other configurations of the MPI uh, to see if that is a common finding or if it's a rare finding just in this case. But I think these kinds of empirical studies that sort of leave any priors to the side and just look at the data and, and try to see what we can learn are necessary because particularly anthropometric data, in my view, are so important for children and yet often not uh, part of other surveys. And so looking at the value added that they bring in terms of SDG localization, regional targeting, not at the household level, um, that, that could be really important. But agreed, Katie, that it would be probably in the advantage of a paper like this to have more attention to the composition, um, to the different age specific deprivations children experience in the new dimensions, et cetera, to flesh out the policy value added when we actually have that richer data set. But thank you so much. So we're nearly at time. Um, I do not know uh, if uh, there are other people who would like to come in. I see that Sam McQuillan has put in this question. So I'll take it as the last question, um, but please do feel free to pop others in um, for later. So Sam asks how our results differ from income-based estimates of child poverty in the region. And which of the three measures, the proxy, the child disaggregated, or the individual child, are the most similar in terms of headcount ratio to uh, monetary-based poverty for measure for Pakistan? Ms. Wang? Yeah, as far as uh, monetary, based poverty measures are concerned. First of all, I, uh, to my knowledge, they are not disaggregated by age. They are just uh, published at the national level. And for some reason, I think that they are not even uh, disaggregated at provincial level. I think th that was one of the issues with the, this is some of the political issue that they don't want to uh, politicize the whole process. So that's why even they don't do that at the provincial level. For sure, I think that they don't do it at the uh, for the age disaggregation because this is a, a common understanding that because it is a household level indicator and th that is based on for like the cost of basic needs. So that is based on that. So probably they don't uh, publish. Perhaps they do that, but they don't publish the age disaggregated results in that. And uh, yes, I think it's uh, another good question to to look into that uh, for Pakistan and for other countries as well. That how. Uh, age disaggregated data for the monetary measures, uh, they are uh, quite different with the results we have in here. Great, thank you so much, Rizwan. Um, so I think that that will conclude our exchange today. You've been a very quiet audience, unusually, but it may be the winter gloom, um, or it may be um, the fact you're saving up your questions for next week. But we do have an exciting. Uh, program coming forward. So I hope that you do join us um, for the, the next uh, episodes, as James would say. And for those who are on the panel, please do link into the Afterglow, where we will talk a bit further. And to the rest of you, we look forward very much to seeing you next week. To Rizwan, to Katie, to James, uh, thank you so much for participating, for commenting, and for hosting this event. And thanks also to Kyle and Jacob for your organization. Take care and till next week.